I'll do a brief presentation about um, what Kalis is and what we do, so you have some context on what we are. Um, and then I'll talk about uh, our contact with diabetes uh, and some issues uh, relating to that for the, we think impact on it and which we've tried to address in our work. And I'm going to use some work we did in Utopia uh, as a case study in relation to practical environmental um, changes that you can make to address diabetes. And I'll then finish on a sort of um, uh, an encouragement that um, advocacy is one of the most powerful tools that, um, that you can use to actually address the underlying causes for diabetes and a lot of other issues that plague the Aboriginal community. Um, and so that's what I'm going to be talking about. So let's start with Kalis. So Kalis is Central Australian Youth Link Up Service, and we're an anti-petrol sniffing program. And here's, uh, here's how we do it. I'm hoping you guys can see my little arrow um, because I'll be using it to illustrate the various paths that we drive down to achieve our ends. Like this is our um, mission statement, I guess you'd call it, and it's painted on the wall. Um, so Kalis operates um, on three main fronts, which is the, the first one is supply reduction. Uh, the second one is demand reduction. And the third one is casework. And just to break down what we've done over the years. So in supply reduction, we um, did some very, very um, strategic and respectful advocacy with the federal government to um, get them to agree to roll out uh, low aromatic fuel into our region, uh, which is, is in our region, it's called opal fuel. Uh, and we did this by, um, partly th through a media campaign, a carefully considered media campaign that made people, particularly on the East Coast, aware of the issues that um, people face here. And that's um, that's something that's, uh, I mentioned that because uh, the issues that people face here in, in terms of diabetes have a similar sort of um, potential for, for motivating people to try and help in that space. So in the supply reduction space, we. We did some respectful media to make people aware of it. As part of that, we always attached the solution, so which was to roll out opal fuel and also to address the underlying causes of the sniffing. We commissioned a cost-benefit analysis which showed how much was spent on uh, sniffing for the duration of uh, the 2005 year, uh, which ended up being $78 million in that one year, which was all the cost across all the various um, agencies and communities and vandalism and crime time and death and all of that sort of stuff. So we, but we had a number that we could sort of wave around, which had some, which wasn't just a number we made up. It was a number that was found by by an independently commissioned um, uh, economic modelling firm, uh, Access Economics, uh, and they. Um, and so when we when we talked to Treasury about. Yes, you'll have to subsidize opal fuel by $20 million a year to make it the same price as normal fuel. Uh, because of that cost benefit analysis, they, they thought, well, maybe that'll work. And maybe that's maybe that's good, good uh, bang for our buck. So, so we approached it on those two fronts. One was to mobilize a general sympathetic support for it. And the other was to have a strong argument, a strong economic argument that it was going to save money, which same in the diabetes space. So, um, so we rolled. So they rolled out um, low aromatic fuel, um, and uh, yeah, across this region and then into other regions. Eventually, after after the initial success of our region, uh, which was that there was a ninety four percent reduction in petrol sniffing, according to Menzies' ongoing studies of communities where they rolled it out, uh, that ninety four percent reduction was sustained over the last eleven years. So it's been a real magic bullet in that regard. And it's given us a time and space to address some of the other issues that are uh, underlying the sniffing and to look at the look at the demand reduction side of things. And that's the um so that was that's supply reduction. Also in supply reduction, we worked like um we worked on other inhalants like glues and sprays. Uh, and in those there is we we work to make sure that they were hard to access. 
So we brought in, um, so we in in partnership with uh, retailers, we brought in cages and we trained retailers about how they were absolutely within their rights not to sell if they felt like somebody was going to be misusing the product they're about to sell. Uh, before that, they were unclear about their their role, and so we found doing training with them, particularly with a nice big policeman along was very useful to get them to understand their obligations when dealing with these dangerous substances. Maybe that we should do the same sort of thing about coke uh, and the diabetes space. But um, so in the supply reduction front, we worked on low aromatic fuel and we worked on supply reduction for um, other inhalants. So that's supply reduction. In demand reduction, we've been supporting youth programs and youth programs are a great diversionary activity for young people. Uh, we commissioned a um, um, social return on investment um, study uh, in order so that we could again talk in the same way that we talked about Opal, talk about the commercial, the financial value of the programs that we were supporting. Because when we rolled out, um, when we talked about rolling at Opal, we also talked about addressing the underlying causes. And so we managed to squeeze some money into into the mix for um, supporting and developing youth programs, which uh, which is good now. Now there are like when Kayla started, there were two youth programs operating in remote communities in the region, and now there are 24, and that's um and it's great great resource for families and young people and communities to have that. And so we commissioned a, a um, social return on investment that showed how many how much value there was. Even in even the simplest youth program, we looked at three: a, a simple one, a well better developed one, and a really Rolls Royce model one. And the, the, even the simple one returned three dollars uh, for every dollar invested. And some of those dollars were health outcomes. It's on our website, the Kalis website. If you're inclined to have a look at it, you can download it from there. Uh, it's called Social Return on Investment, and it's called Investing in the Future. Um, Hopefully, Damien might put up the link to the website uh, so you can have a look at it. And the, our cost benefit analysis is there too, as well as some other documents about that era. So the um, so demand, so we've we've set up and supported youth programs. The computer side of it, we've been working with some philanthropics who've donated, must be close to half a million dollars now worth of um, money to us so we could set up uh, 23 remote community access computer rooms because they're they're great in so many ways, and um, and seven in Alice Springs, some in town camps and other places in Alice Springs, and that's all with philanthropic money because it's quite easy to convince philanthropists that you know computers are educational and that access to them is an important part of modern life, particularly with everything going online. So, and we've also managed to pull in um, twenty three million dollars uh, into infrastructure in remote communities. Uh, in remote communities, a lot of the problems that we had out rolling out youth programs is a lack of anywhere to run them. You know, so with that $23 million and its royalties money, it's all Aboriginal royalties money, um, we've managed to set up and resource um, youth program infrastructure right across the region. And it's a good thing we're doing it because the, the federal government isn't. And we're doing some advocacy at the moment to try and sort of make them realise that it's all very well to fund youth programs, but unless you fund somewhere to have the youth programs, they're not going to really work and you won't really get good bang for your buck. So we're currently in an advocacy program at the moment trying to influence the budget as it, as it appears over the horizon to, to address the lack of, lack of um, uh, R&M for infrastructure in remote communities. And also a lack of funding increase. All the youth programs at Bush are still running on the 2014 money there hasn't been any increases in their funding since then even though the cost of everything have gone up substantially as everybody would know particularly recently so they're um they're well behind the eight ball and they're, they're just on the point of having to think about closing some of the youth programs that we worked so hard to start so um we've been advocating with the new federal minister and she seems receptive to our advocacy um hopefully she can come up with some dollars to to keep young people happy out bush. Uh, everyone's so worried about people coming into town and yet people are forced by a lot of economic force forces to go into town, not the least of which is access to resources. And so putting resources out bush is a, is a, it's a no-brainer really. And I'll, I'll touch on that a bit later. 
So we also do some casework. Uh, it's changed over the years. And originally it was casework with loads of people who were sniffing and there weren't many resources to do anything about it. But over time we've developed resources and now a lot of our casework is um, partly dealing with the, the brain damaged ex sniffers and partly the occasional outbreaks that do still happen. We have a role in relation to them and we have funds that we use to help um, people access rehab, uh, residential rehab and to, uh, and support families if they've got ideas for, you know, placing kids with family, with other family away from the temptation and breaking up sort of like groups of sniffers and stuff. So that's that's our casework component uh, of, of the job. Um, I'll also touch on legislation just briefly, which is that um, uh, when Marion Scrimmager, who's currently the, in, in uh, Parliament, um, was the Minister for Health, she brought in some legislation in uh, 2005, the Volatile Substance Abuse Prevention Act. And that's a great act because it's a, a medical model for dealing with drug addiction rather than a criminal justice model. And so people can, there can be interventions in people's drug use, but they're not criminal interventions. People get um, sent off to rehab if they're, if they're sniffing at a point where they're really endangering themselves. And only 2% of the people who we refer for this sort of assessment are in that state, but that's a lifesaver. And it's, it's something that the top end doesn't have a calus, and so it doesn't have anybody really overseeing that to the, to the degree that we do down here. We've had no deaths since the rollout of alcohol down here, whereas there's been a substantial number in the top end, partly because they they haven't had the level of advocacy and oversight that an external agency can bring to government departments who, who often suffer from a lack of corporate knowledge and and the sort of like I don't know a silo mentality. It sort of means that you know everyone thinks everyone else should be doing something, but nobody's doing anything. So that's the Volatile Substance Abuse Prevention Act, and we we have a role, full role in it um, to start to start a, a, an assessment process to, that can that in two percent of cases results in people being mandated into treatment, which has saved lives. Um, we're, we're, there's also another bit of um, legislation that we advocated for the Low Aromatic Fuel. Act. It was a bill when this mural was um, painted, but it's an act now, and that's an act, a federal act that can be used to force people to swap over to to um, low aromatic fuel if you can demonstrate that people are that kids are sniffing because uh, a, a petrol station refuses to swap over. So that's a great bit of legislation. It's been used in Tennant Creek. Half the petrol stations in Tennant Creek refused to swap, even though there was lots of sniffing. So the federal government use this act we reported you know we sort of gave them the information they needed to, to fulfill a criteria to use it and they did and so all the petrol stations in Tennant Creek now sell low aromatic standard unleaded and the sniffing dropped away to approximately zero uh, when they did so that's a, that's another so that, so that supports our our supply reduction work and supply reduction is what when I talk about diabetes and, and uh, thank you for your patience uh, we'll talk about diabetes. Um, this background will sort of like make sense in terms of like the, the, the component of thinking that I bring to your to your to your discussions. Uh, I'm not a medical person, but, I, but the, to some of the things that we've learned how to do and that we've done in Calus may be of use to you. Uh, I'm happy. So that's Calus, and that's the Calus story. And there's a website if you want to delve into it anymore. So. Um, one thing we learned from sniffing was talking to individual sniffers was pretty much a waste of time for two reasons. <clears throat> One, because when they were sniffing, their brains were sort of like a bit scrambled in it. Um, and we know from the rehab facilities that we sent them to that, um, uh, again, Menzies did some studies where kids in those rehab facilities played computer games but the computer games watched them and measured their response times and their memory and um, a whole lot of other cerebral factors that sort of like uh, underpin playing computer games. And uh, they found basically that it took six weeks before the brain recovered from um, a serious burst of, um, of petrol sniffing. 
And so there was, and so once, and that was pretty much what everybody in rehab facilities thought anyway. There's no point trying to talk to kids when they, when they were sniffing or high or even afterwards, because you know they would forget that you'd said anything to them 10 minutes later. And so the rehab facilities then changed their behavior and, and basically just let kids hang out and eat a lot and sleep a lot. And uh, they didn't start trying to do any sort of talking to people about serious matters until six weeks in. Uh, where, and they got much better response as a, as a result. So that's one reason why you know, talking to sniffers was not very effective. And the other is because people, when people are addicted to things, the research in the AOD sphere has shown that education is um, the least effective intervention you can have with people like that. The, um, you can, and they've, like the America went down the path of thinking that education was a way of dealing, dealing with uh, drug addiction. So they rolled out a whole lot of education stuff. Uh, but then when they did some sort of evaluation of it after a few years, they found that even though kids could score well in terms of knowing all of the answers for you know the problems with ganja and the problems with ice and all that sort of stuff, it didn't affect their actual behavior. And the... Um, and there, and the, so, like, it, you can educate people, but that doesn't change their behaviour. Mm. And so that that gave us a, an insight into um, into why various forms of intervention in the past in this space hadn't worked, and and it reinforced our idea that the way to really start was to do supply reduction. Um, so yeah, with the with the powerful forces of addiction operating on people's brains, it's you know you. You, it's very difficult to sort of try and influence them, and um, it seems like if you can get people off a substance for a while, like it seems like with petrol it was six weeks, and with other things it's maybe at least two weeks um, to four weeks. If you can get them through that period, or if they will go through that period themselves and know that they'll feel worse for that period, but afterwards they'll feel better than they than they have felt for ages, then that's that's a that's a way through it, but to to think that and to think that just telling people things, and this is where like when well I'll move I'll segue neatly into our utopia case case work, uh, case plan case study. Um, when we were working in utopia, we had government funding to make life better for children in the utopia region, which is a um, a cattle station that was bought for the Aboriginal tribes people who owned that land. Back in '78, and, um, and the uh, so and we Kalis had funding to um, make life better for children out there for a number of years. And we so that was great fun. And as part of that, we we ran across diabetes as an emerging issue in that region, and deafness, and you know all sorts of other things. But and one of the things that that we noticed was that people were doing um, basically a form of education with kids where they would sort of, you know, have a whole bunch of kids and they'd go through charts and they'd say, don't drink Coke. And the kids go, yeah, we won't drink Coke, but they drink Coke, you know, and they just, and unfortunately the consequence of their education, that education program was they were being taught to lie to health professionals. Uh, they were telling people what they thought they wanted to hear and it was having no effect on their behaviour. So we looked, we looked at Coke and we looked at why people were drinking Coke and, uh, and one of the contributing factors was that the water, the boar water that came out of taps in Utopia was salty and warm and it really wasn't very nice. And so, you know, it was people were buying soft drink because the, the option, the option, the free option of water was untenable really. And so we, um, so another good thing about having that um, that particular funding program is we had we had big bags of gold that we could spend on making life better for kids. And here's one of the things we spent it on. So filtered chilled water. So there were five primary schools and a high school in Utopia. And we set up one of these, two of those in the high school and one at each of the primary schools. And it's a it's an invulnerable like it's steel and solid and, and and it hasn't been vandalized in the time that we're you know in the seven years since it's been there we do regular maintenance on it 
and it uh, filters the water, it puts it through the uh, so, some um, domestic filters, so it's easy for teachers to change. They just unscrew the filter and put a new one in. And um, then there's one switch they throw, uh, and in, so in summer they get chilled water, and in winter they turn it off. Let's get normal room temperature water, and the water comes out of the, out of these taps. Very drinkable. It's it's cold and it's delicious. And the school teachers report that the kids are much less. They're more better hydrated at school, um, and they're they're much better behaved and they're more capable of learning because they they're not hyped up with sugar. And they um, and the parents like it too because they can say, you know, they can not spend money on coke. You know, if they haven't got money, and say, oh, let's go and, go and have some nice cold water. And so they do. And so I bring this one. This is an example of of a of a of a demand reduction strategy that um, that I encourage you guys to think about when you're talking when you're talking about diabetes in, in communities. You have to be realistic about what choices people have got. Somebody once wisely said, don't, don't judge somebody by their choices until you know what their options are. And so this is a way we affected, we improved the options that people had to comply with um, health, health ideas about sort of like not putting so much of a strain in your body with sugar. Now, the, addict, the addictive qualities of sugar is a whole other story. But this is, um, this is one of our ways of trying to address diabetes through environmental changes. And here's another one. So the store when we when we first went there only had sort of uh, sort of fridges where you keep Coke sort of fridges, you know the tall ones that were really chilly, and so you couldn't see what was in the bottom, and they and it was too cold at the back, and veg, vegetables didn't last very long. So we bought them one of these um, uh, a, a veggie chiller for the store, and it uh, and they. The um, fresh fruit and vegetable sales increased substantially once it was installed because the veggies were in better condition and you could see them. And, uh, and so it became easier for people to shop for them and, and for, the, for, the, um, for the store to order them in because when they ordered them in before and had to put them in the inappropriate sort of fridges, often they'd just go rotten before they were sold. So another environmental change. So, and we also worked with the store on a number of other things, including another Menzies thing. Menzies features a lot in this story, uh, which was that the um, Menzies had a program where the store agreed to give all of their sales data to Menzies, and Menzies would then process it and send back to the store committee uh, information about how much salt, how much sugar, um, and a few other things like that were sold, went through the till, so that they could evaluate strategies that they were trying, uh, like, um, yeah, like, so it gave some, gave some direct feedback about what, what was being consumed in Utopia from that main store. So, um, yeah, so there are a couple of strategies that we, that we brought about and that was, um, and I, I flagged those with you because if you want to address diabetes, you have to look at the environment in which you're working. And, and unfortunately, Telling people it isn't really going to do it. Um, you really have to sort of like make realistic options available for people as a that's the first step. And then maybe when your education program can sort of like at least point people to a realistic option. Um, so I would, I would encourage you to sort of think widely about what's going on in communities to visit and to think about sort of advocacy to sort of change that environment because that's that's how you change the factors that push people towards towards um, diabetes. And just to finish up, so what I'm suggesting is that if you haven't got the resources for these sort of things, that one of the really useful things you could try and do is get them, is to, is to sort of identify, like in the way we identified getting, getting the um, stuff we needed for, for Opal was by working with local community groups to work to who realize the problem and then advocating on behalf of them and with them as partners to powerful people in Canberra who could make some changes that could make a difference. And there are changes that could make a difference in remote communities, like just a few that just pop to mind is like um, making subsidizing remote community stores so that sort of fresh fruit and vegetables and all the really healthy stuff 
was way cheaper than what you could buy equivalently in Alice Springs. That would have two effects. One would be to sort of like push people towards you know, the um, uh, more affordable options and better healthy options by making it cheaper. And the other thing would be to, to make remote communities more attractive places to live. Because at the moment, like remote community stores, the costs of things are about 100% more than they are in Alice Springs. And Alice Springs is higher than Darwin because of because they're at the end of the supply chain, the attenuated supply chain finishes in those remote communities. And everything's so expensive there that a lot of people move into town because they literally cannot afford to feed their children on when they're on welfare. 80% of people in remote communities are on welfare. And they're the ones who are on welfare. 48% of people, according to um, the census, in remote communities are on nothing. They have no income. They are neither on benefits, unemployment benefits, nor um, nor in employment. And those 48% of people who probably fall out of the system, haven't got the English, you know, can't stay on the complicated sort of Centrelink systems, they're, they're fed by their families. And so that impoverishes everybody. And so remote communities, if you wanted to address some of the issues in remote communities, you'd have to start, start at the base of the pyramid and make sure that there was really cheap, really good food readily available in remote communities. And then you can do education programs like the um, other education programs that happened once once the food was there was um, the uh, bachelor started running sort of training training courses for young mothers and they'd go down to the local shop and buy stuff and then go back to bachelor education center and cook it up and have big feasts and stuff like that and and it sort of got people in the path of knowing how to cook these vegetables that were suddenly in their field of vision and um, so yeah so that's one example of how you can maybe address through advocacy some of the root causes of, um, of the diabetes epidemic that you're currently facing. So that's my, that's my presentation and thank you and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks for the present presentation, Blair. That was really interesting hearing about how you applied that framework of uh, supply reduction, demand reduction, and also individualised casework to the issue of petrol sniffing in uh, remote central Australia. I think it'd be interesting for our viewers to consider how we might think about conceptualising diabetes through a framework like that as well. Uh, but I welcome our um, participants to ask some questions in the Q&A box. And as always, you can upvote the questions that you're most interested in hearing answers to. Uh, we've got Angela Titmus here, our paediatric endocrinologist, and uh, Stephen Vesey uh, here to answer some questions. So I'll just give them a moment to start coming through. I might start with one for you, Blair. Um, I thought it was really interesting the way that you're able to, I uh, guess, use economic analysis to strengthen your arguments of what you could see working on the ground. Um, what gave you that idea and who did, who did you decide to use to um, get those reports uh, completed? Um, we used, we decided to do it because we sort of all put our heads together and worked out a, a, a strategy for how to move forward. And we had to move, we had to move on, the, on the sort of emotional front we had to move by informing people about the, the nature of the problem. And we had to have a really simple solution that we could attach to that. So it wasn't just a sort of, you know, dire sort of whinge. Uh, so we, we, needed, we needed to approach it on, on, on two fronts. One front being a, a media campaign to make it an issue and mm -hmm. to have the solution in with the issue. And another front being on that economic analysis front, because we knew that that's fundamentally what government would need to have even even the people who like were on our side, the uh, politicians who were sort of quite supportive, they still needed that economic that economic analysis because governments and treasury particularly just love numbers. And so we what like I guess what I'm saying is one will not work without the other. You can publish a report, and so many reports have been published. And I imagine diabetes is there were just yeah. like there were wheelbarrows full of reports about sniffing. Yeah. But without the sort of advocacy push to make it something that people cared about, politicians cared about, and the media cared about, 
none of those reports ever went anywhere. So we, so it has to be a sort of like you have to think about it in terms of like an overall strategy to how to move how to move it forward. Yeah, that's interesting to hear. I guess about the strategic approach and. Uh, interesting to hear too about, I guess, appealing to people's emotions as well. Like we, we obviously need the data and the numbers. And like you said, we've got plenty of that with diabetes, but appealing to that um, part of people that perhaps want to see some changes, uh, uh, perhaps something we can do too. I've got some questions from here. Uh, so from the Q&A section, um, who did you engage with first in the community Blair, when you started going about this work? Um, with petrol sniffing, it was quite straightforward because when we started going out into communities, there were like literally dozens of sniffers in each community. So we would have a, um, we would have a meeting, a community meeting, which everyone would like, come to. The sniffers would come because they were worried people would be talking about them and all their families would come because they were worried about the kids sniffing. And we would melt a box a uh, polystyrene box. I could try and find a video of it here somewhere. I've got it on my thing. But basically then we would, we would you know, often I would borrow a bottle of petrol from a, from a nearby sniffer and pour it on a, a polystyrene box. And then a box would melt away to just sludge. And it was a very effective piece of circuits because it didn't require English. It didn't require any sort of like conceptualizations of, you know, you know, damage to neurons and blah, 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 all of that sort of white fellow sort of, and, and all of the sort of like the scientific paradigm, which wasn't, you know, you know operating in that space. It was, a, it was a space where other paradigms were operating, including sorcery. So by melting a box with the petrol that people were sniffing, it was a very strong statement and a message. And then we found that the people who stayed at the meeting and like and we talk about issues and we talk about what we could do about it and those meetings became the people who who were at those meetings became the core group of people who we worked with in each of those communities and quite a lot of them agreed to come to canberra when we were doing advocacy stuff we got some funding from um red cross to bring to bring people from remote communities down to canberra which was great because that means that they were they were the ones talking and they were talking about their families, and the NPY some of the NPY people who came, um, they 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 made up a song about sniffing like and um, was in Kudinjara and would sing it at press conferences and it was they were they were great at, at playing the emotional strings mm. of people, and um, and so like that's that's how we did it we we started in the community and we took people from the community. Um, with us on the whole journey and they were guiding hands in it and they were the advocates who made the difference when we when we did get the media which we were generating in Canberra and Sydney mm -hmm. and the when we released so when when we created that report that cost benefit analysis we gave it to governments two months before we released it to the public because we didn't want to sort of ambush them and so when, when it was, by doing that, it meant that they could sort of have a good look at it and they could check the numbers and they could brief all the politicians uh, about what it was about. And so we, we didn't get that sort of, you know, ambushed politician knee-jerk reaction sort of thing. People, the politicians really appreciated the, the, the warning. And so we, we got some really rational sort of like responses from them about it because they had plenty of time to consider and then when we did release it, we did we released it with a big fanfare in Sydney, and Pitanjara women came down, and people from Panier and around came down, and we all um, they mostly uh, spoke to spoke to the combined media about about that story, and uh, and it became it became a media thing uh, in about two thousand and seven, and that media thing has resulted in twenty million dollars a year ever since, and it's uh, virtual elimination of petrol sniff. Mm. That's uh, amazing to hear about just how calculated and strategic you were in your advocacy efforts. And I think there's probably a lot that we could learn from that. I will bring Steve in here um, with a question. And Steve, I understand that, you know, you're a deputy principal, you work with a, a lot of kids and have done for a number of years now. A lot of the young people that we might work with might be, you know, disengaged in one form or another. 
what are some of the strategies that you find most effective for working with young people who might not be uh, particularly engaged in uh, whatever we'd like them to be? Yeah, uh, and, and thank you for being inviting me to be part of the panel. And Blair, um, yeah. being an Alice Springs boy, um, it's wonderful to hear the exceptional work that's going on there, um, to see the changes within the community and particularly around petrol sniffing. Um, thank you for sharing that and the work that you're, you and your organisation has done has been amazing. Um, it's, it's a tough one in that sense. How do you engage someone that doesn't want to necessarily be engaged? Um, and it's that conversation. And I go back to one of Blair's comments. It's also about being realistic about what you can do with the, the groups and organisations and the promises that you can make. But it is a conversation. It's inviting them to come and have that conversation, meeting people where they're at um, and being realistic that, yes, we've got this long-term objective, but let's start with a very short-term goal. And it could be just a conversation around a footy match. Um, talking about their favourite footy team and building that relationship to start off with before addressing the issue. If you're not, if you haven't got with young people that relationship and they don't feel included in that conversation, nothing's going to change. And I think it's getting voice for young people to, to allow a conversation. It's then bringing in your external organisations. It's then addressing the issues, but that's not going to happen until there is a, that relationship and they feel trust, um, particularly with our First Nations people, that if, if you're not trusted, they're not going to be involved in that conversation or, or want to know what's going on. Um, and then it's the families building trust for the families and then starting the, the bigger conversations around that. I hope that addresses the, the question, Damien. Yeah, that's nice. What I get from that is really, I guess, taking a relationship first approach and also giving time. And I think that's one of the tricky things sometimes. And Angela, you might be able to comment on this better than I can is, the challenges we have in health with the limited time we might have with people that, you know, once every however many weeks or months it is between appointments and being very goal directed in what we might like them to get from their treatment and acknowledging that we do have to meet people with where they're at. And perhaps if we invest some time in building that relationship, we might get further in the long run. But Angela, did, did you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, and I think it's completely right. I think we all get a bit caught up in our specific goals or what we're trying to yeah. um, achieve and actually we're losing sight of the long-term goal and that's really probably achieved by building that relationship and building the trust and the connections. And then you can make, and sometimes we don't, I think, realise the power of that and how that actually has effect um, at a time when someone's life might be in a different situation and they can actually do various changes and they've remembered those kind of conversations and trust. Um, but yeah, we have to, I think, take the time and actually build that relationship. I had a question for both um, Blair and Steve, if that's okay, about how you build a youth friendly space. So um, yeah, just about what we could do that would make a youth friendly space. Steve, do you want to go first? Yeah, I'm having, I think it's asking asking the youth what do they want in that space. It's about each, I don't think there's a set answer for those because it's going to be different for each community. It's going to be different for each group. It's about what do they want in that space? What do they need in that space? Um, and for that space to be successful, we can have great ideas around it, but if there's no conversation from the youth and their involvement in it, it's not going to be successful. So I think... I don't think there's a, an, a set answer. I think it's got to suit the, the demographic and the environment for each person and for each community as well to make that work. Yeah, that's that's totally right. Um, one of one of the there are some useful features, which is um, that that, that um, sometimes it's we found that it's good to have boys only and girls only spaces. Um, that doesn't like if you just have a girls only space you make problems <laughs> but if you have a boys only space and a girls only space and a communal space then you can create an environment that's easier for young people to be in um so that's just a, a demographic sort of like thing that if you can if you have the capacity to create those those delineated spaces then that, that can solve a lot of problems with people feeling embarrassed and teasing each other and all of that sort of stuff um, I think, sorry, where the other one is yeah. food. If you've got food, food's amazing. Yeah, there's a lot of hunger out there, that's for sure. If food's a great way to start a conversation and to bring people into that space, whether it's a barbecue or whatever it may be, um, but food, 
um, particularly with our, our young men. Um, I'm just thinking outside, I've got our, our lunch going on and how many of our young boys are talking around food at the moment. So food's a great way to, to entice. And if you've got that, that availability, that's going to bring people to, into that space as well. I just heard today about a youth program that's doing something innovative, which is um, the older people in the youth program uh, once a month cook dinner for local stakeholders. And they, so, and they enjoy cooking it for them and the stakeholders come in and then they quiz stakeholders about, you know, well, how do I get to do your job, basically? And, you know, how did you get there and how can I get there? And it's, uh, that, that, would, that seemed to be a really interesting initiative that they're doing that in um, Yulabu, um, Mount Allen. And it's, um, that, that's, that seemed to be a good idea. So like on, on other programs, I know where the, where the youth workers have got the time and resources to get the kids to do the shopping and cooking themselves. Um, that's, it's sort of like really a great way of involving people and skilling people up. And people, people are hungry and they will <laughs> they'll jump through quite a few hoops to, to get at a, at a nice meal. So we, we do, you know, the, um, uh, Fred Hollow's cookbook. So the youth, the youth workers, you know, and the kids who are involved in it sit down, look at the Fred Hollow's cookbook, decide what they're going to cook, go down to the shop, walk down to the shop, bring it all back, cook it up, give it to the community. And, or I think it's you either pay a gold coin or you do the washing up afterwards. And um, yeah, and, it's, and that's that was the basis of a really good afternoon's youth program that so, to, taught people how, how, to, how to shop, you know, how to cook and how to sort of clean up afterwards and it's pretty all very useful life skills and that's mm -hmm. and so yeah but Steve's right food is food is the magic bullet and it's very respectful to sort of like if you if you if you want people to be in big places because they're all hungry and they're all circulating around wondering where the next meal's coming from you know and, and if you can sort of reassure them that they're that they don't have to worry about that even just for a little while and you've got their attention and you're building that relationship that Steve identified as absolutely crucial. Yeah, there's nothing worse than, and I sympathize with, with medical people who've got limited time, but there's nothing more likely to get people to sort of tell you things that aren't true than somebody they don't really know very much, suddenly asking them some very personal questions. You know, if they don't clam up, they'll just tell a whole bunch of lies it, because it's not what you do. You know? It's, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, those things are built on, as Steve says, relationship. The, and another thing which, if, if you've got the time and space for it, some sharing of your own personal or family stories about addiction or diabetes or illness or anything like that, if you can, if you can make them I statements rather than questions, if you can raise a topic by talking about a topic without making them questions, you've got a much better chance of people listening and feeling capable of throwing stuff in themselves. If you ask a direct question, just don't do it really. It's like, and I sympathize with your medical situation where you sort of got a limited time frame, you've got to ask those questions, but in terms of how to actually create, to create that engagement with young people, just telling stories about your own life and about people you know and about people they know that are topical. And so give people an opportunity to throw something in that's relevant if they choose to is, is the way we do it. That's, that's a pretty standard sort of way of dealing with, with addiction. And that's why people who were themselves once addicts uh, are, are usually make by far the best um, counsellors in that setting because they've, they've got a depth of personal experience to draw on, make people feel like it's not, it's not their own problem, you know, it's a widely, a widely faced problem and, and that here's somebody who's dealt with it. You know. Damien, can I just jump on top of a comment Blair's made and, and particularly around, and I agree with, with Blair 100%, that, that notion of relationships, but I guess the bigger question for me to, to, that, to our wider group is how do schools and medical professions build partnerships around those ongoing conversations and relationships that get to that point where we've seen some great outcomes for, for the young people that we're working in. I guess sitting in my environment as a deputy principal, what are the conversations that we've had with medical professionals around our type 2 diabetes um, students at our school? We don't have any here at the school that I'm at at the present, but how do we build those relationships and particularly in our First Nations where Schools probably have that trust at the moment in the relationship, um, acknowledging that there are huge, uh, huge differentials in attendance rates throughout 
throughout our communities, but there is that sense of you come to school, you feel safe. So how can we build better partnerships? And whether that's training for staff to understand that the, the underlying influences of type two diabetes, but then working with the medical professions to share what we know about those relationships back to our medical professionals to, to build those relationships quicker, but with trust mm -hmm. as well. Thanks, Steve. That's really interesting. I'll bring Angela in actually to comment on what do you think of that, Angela? What's the feasibility of health working with schools? Yeah, we often try to do, but I'd actually like um, to hear from both Blair and Steve about advice or strategies um, or how could health professionals work better with youth workers and also with schools um, in terms of improving the care that we provide to young people. Um, I've got something I can throw in, which is um, when when we when we we're out doing the the, bot, the uh, box melting, and we were first establishing relationships in communities, one thing that we found really worked was to come up with a plan. So we'd we'd say, well, what can we do in the long term? What can we do in the short term? What can we do today to to deal with this problem? And we and when we and if we if any if we could collectively come up with something that we could try and do and then if we did our part even if we failed even if the sort of plan didn't actually work if we if we we, we engaged respectfully with people came up with a plan followed through reported back that was the basis of a of a relationship and it was it wasn't the basis of a sort of like false relationship you know if it, if it totally failed we'd say well that completely failed you know and we would sort of we'd learn from it and move on but so i guess one thing that if you if as a way of engaging with um with with kids would be if you could come up with a something that they could do to like address the sort of you know diabetes issue whether there was you know something you know um you know, on a supply reduction front or you know or you know, doing a survey with you know with people about you know what what they would what sort of other drinks they would like to have that weren't sort of so sugary or or you know anyway just and it's something that, that I guess I guess the idea is to make it to to form a group where you and them have a shared objective it's like being on a sports team you know like the bonding that happens in a sports team where your shared objective is getting that ball down there. It's a powerful thing, and it's um, and you can use that to build build relationships, ongoing relationships. But so uh, that's uh, that's something we did, and maybe that's something you could, you could try, uh, and that's something you could do with youth workers. Is sort of like if you want to engage with youth workers and say, well, what, what can we do in this community, you know, that uh, could realistically make a difference? And let's let's talk to the young people about. You know about it and let's have a few ideas to put to them and let's see what they think about it. and let's make a plan even if it's got a tenuous potential for working but have a go because it, that's the real the real message is is that you're working with them that's the real message and that's the, your really objective is is that communication and that developing that trust and very much echoing Blair's comments around that as well, Angela. It's also, for me, it's about identifying the right people in the school. Um, I think my experience has been that our nurses, our senior leaders, our, our year-level coordinators are involved in that process because it's about how do we manage it at school if something happens with that person, not necessarily going, well, what, what are we trying to address at the bigger picture? And I'm just thinking within our staff, where is our, if this was to happen at O'Loughlin, would our IEWs be involved, our Indigenous education workers involved in the conversations and underlying, well, what's the purpose of us sorting out this issue? What are we trying to achieve and identifying what, what role the school plays and then developing the right team around that to build, going back to building that relationship to, and then, then Blair's comment around what are we, what's the outcome that we're trying to achieve through this partnership as well? With the main objective being the partnership. Uh, one thing that we, which we did during the COVID story was we made TikTok videos with um, with people. Um, that's a nice achievable thing you could do with a group of kids. You know, you could so, and with uh, and sort of you could sort of uh, address some topic that sort of is, is relevant to them and they feel interested in, and, you could, and they could make TikTok videos and circulate them, and that's 
you know, then, then you're talking their language. It's nice. Have you used social media at all for uh, your school or, or objective, Steve? Um, we started a play around one of our one of the big issues around the country at the moment is vaping. So how do we address the causes of vaping in that sense? So we're looking at part of the work with our students that, that do vape as well. What are the, the health health sort of effects around that? But to portray that back to other students and using it as a social media platform. Just listen to Blair talk about TikTok's gone, the ID gone, or one of their presentations could be around creating that the impacts of vaping using a TikTok video. So social media is really important and technology. So it's speaking using the mediums that's going to meet our students around that, whether it's YouTube, but finding the right YouTubers. Um, our students are on YouTube all the time, and we know particularly in First Nations and community, YouTube's such a, a powerful source. So how do we engage those conversations where they're at as well? I think it's really important using the right um, means to achieve that. And kids know the technology for, for that stuff, and particularly, particularly YouTube. Like um, You can do it all on your phone. You can, you know, make it, edit it, put music on it, do special effects, and then post it from your phone. It's a, and, you know, you, if you started doing it, you might find that they're the experts, which is another great, great <laughs> yeah. dynamic to have in that engagement. And sorry, David, I, I think it's important that we take our time with, with these conversations and partnerships, that, that it's not rushed, and we put the resources needed to, we know if we're talking from an education point of view, the student's not happy or it's not able to function in a classroom, well, they're not going to achieve those educational outcomes that we're trying to achieve. So it is being really patient and make, putting the time and effort into addressing this relationship and partnership with our health professionals, with that student to, to address the concerns and make sure that they're going to be successful in the classroom. There's no point in trying the student to achieve academically if we haven't working with the families to address those causes around that. Um, and I think it was Belinda that's made the comment that it's, all parties to connect um, and it's our busyness that we've all got these objectives to achieve we've got these goals it's actually going well what's the most important goal identifying that and working through that as a step-by-step -step process hmm. can i just add in something damien sorry um yeah. i was just thinking back to previous life as a youth worker when <laughs> i knew blair many years ago um and one thing that i um the community where I worked, the um, nurses in the clinic identified that they weren't seeing many teenagers in the clinic because I think there was um, stigma or shame about going to the clinic because people would ask why they're in the waiting room or what they were doing. And um, and so the two of the nurses used to take turns to actually come to our evening um, young women's or young men's nights and just join in. Um, and then gradually that helped really build that relationship where they knew those staff personally rather than in a clinic or health professional setting and then use the back room of the youth centre actually to see some young people um, and that kind of just take them off and see them. And then, um, and I just something that could be um, a way to build out relationships and work with youth workers, as Blair mentioned, that um, the young people are already there and um, the clinic can be quite threatening or lack of privacy space and we need to be kind of aware of that. Yeah, totally agree. Uh, I've got a question here from the audience. Uh, so obviously your staff uh, in an organisation, your size, Blair and Steve as well, are really important. And the question is, how do you recruit youth workers and what kind of support and mentoring uh, do you give to them along the way to make sure they're successful in their roles? It's funny, Steve and I were talking that, about that before we came on. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's an issue right across all professions at the moment is, uh, is recruiting and half the remote senior or remote youth worker positions in our region, which is the bottom half of the NT, are vacant. Um, and we're, we're having a lot of trouble recruiting. It's, um, it's a tricky thing. Like the way, the, what we try, I'll, I'm happy to outline, which is, you know, we put things on ethical jobs, put jobs on ethical jobs, the ethical job website and seek. We have it on our Facebook um, and the Tanager website when they're and, and uh, that's uh, yeah, and that's that's how we do it. A lot of our workers seem to come to us through word of mouth. People who've either worked for us before or have known people who've worked for us before, and so that's that seems to be a, a one way of doing it. But it's mm -hmm. uh, it's a problem. Um, Steve, it's a problem for you too, what I was saying. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's the same with the education. One comment I would make around that's also, and to me, it's really important not to employ a person for the sake of filling that role. It's getting the right person into that. You can damage, particularly in the in the use sense, if you get the wrong person, relationships can be broken for years. And that trust within the organisation within the school is sometimes beyond repair. So it's also been, yes, we want people to fill and it puts burdens on other staff members and, and all your support mechanisms around that. But if you get that wrong person, that can damage and do so much more damage than being patient and finding the right one. Because and I go, we go back and Blair and I have spoken about so much is about the relationship. If you get that wrong person that damages relationships, you're not going to have any success at all engaging the conversations and engaging our young people around any issues that we're trying to deal with. And in terms of support, the second part of the question is about support. Mm. So, Kalis, we always really try and look after our workers because they are precious commodities. And so we we do really realistic inductions for them. Sort of, you know, we don't sugarcoat what they're going to be doing. It's a hard job, um, Angela knows. And it's um and it's getting harder as people are getting poorer, as people, you know, because people in remote communities are their, their um, household income has gone down between the last two censuses. It's, um, so it's a, it is a, it's a hard job. Um, we have, um, we have a, some, a, a trained um, psychologist who's on tap, who has worked extensively in remote communities. And so he's not good enough to do Aboriginal 101 with him when you, when you talk to him. And he's, he basically any, anybody in our region who wants to access him, we call him professional development, but he's, he's and he does, he talks about the issues that you come across in these, in these spaces. Um, and he, we authorize it, but we don't, we know nothing about, you know, we just pay, pay the bills, we know, and no reporting goes uh, from him to anybody, unless it's a mandatory reporting thing, but certainly it doesn't feed back any information to us about what the various youth workers talk about and what their issues are and that sort of stuff. So that, that's a whole, that's, we think that's important that there's a, we, we put into place something that's independent of Kalis. So he, so youth workers can bitch about Kalis if they want to, uh, and it'll never get back to us. You know? So uh, that that's a sort of safety valve that we put in. We also have very experienced youth workers working in Kalis who know that space really well. And so they can give very realistic advice about you know, if problems come up and we, you know, then they can, you know, they won't give advice that sort of comes from an uninformed place. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the, as Stephen said, you know, if you get the wrong person in the job and they've never done the job and they're handing out advice based on their lack of any experience, you can really mess things up, you know, particularly if, you, if they sort of have the attitude, oh, get tough on those kids, you know, not realize that those kids are tougher than they will ever be. And um, so, Having experienced workers in the system um, for um, um, for advice and support for those workers. Plus, there's all the logistical stuff. We look after them. We make sure they've got sat phones and good cars and somewhere to live. And, you know, um, uh, yeah. You know, we have regular contact. Like we have every Tuesday and Thursday, we do a Zoom with all our remote workers, and we all we all talk and and it's uh, and laugh and you know they they feel like they're part of something, you know, there's a problem in remote communities if you don't have something systematic like that. People can just go, why am I here? Nobody cares, mm -hmm. you know, just out here doing these things and nobody knows and nobody cares and it's really demoralising. So. so there are systemic ways that we try and support them. Uh, I've outlined, outlined the main ones of those. 